Welcome to Because I Said So, Moments in History, where we're going to take a look at some historical people and how God used them to bring His Word to us. Before we get started, there are three things you and I need to know. Firstly, I know this might surprise you, but the Bible was not originally written in English. It was written over a period of 1,500 years in three different languages, Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic. And from those original languages, we have the translations that we read today in our individual languages. Secondly, not everyone in history has been overly excited about having the Bible translated into their own language. Seriously, what's wrong with these people? Don't you want to read the Bible? Like, come on, somebody, anybody, does anyone have a reason? Even as far back as 400 AD, people were upset with a guy named Jerome for trying to translate God's word into Latin. This is Jerome. What's up, Jerome? Eh. He and his colleagues succeeded, however, and produced something we call the Latin Vulgate. Vulgate as in vulgar, which means common. He wanted to put the Bible into the hands of common people who spoke Latin, not Hebrew, Greek, or Aramaic. So, Latin Vulgate. Remember that term for later, it's gonna be important. Thirdly, although we'll be talking about men who gave their lives for scripture, it's important for us not to forget that God is the real hero of this story. So, let's get started. In England during the 1300s, the Bible was only available in Latin. If you remember, 900 years before this, Jerome had translated the Bible into Latin the Latin Vulgate. That's what they had as their common Bible at this time. This would have been great if people in 14th century England spoke Latin, but they didn't speak Latin, they spoke English. Enter John Wycliffe, a man who, like Jerome, had a passion for people to have God's word available to them in their language. So he did just that. Along with some help from his friends, he worked hard at translating the Bible from the Latin Vulgate into English for the common people. And just like we saw with Jerome 900 years before, there were some people who were appalled at Wycliffe's efforts to make God's word available to the masses. Someone even said this about his translation. By this translation, the scriptures have become vulgar, and they are more available to lay and even to women who can read than they were to learned scholars who have a high intelligence so the pearl of the gospel is scattered and trodden underfoot by swine. And we can thank God and God alone that Wycliffe disagreed. Even up until his death, side note, he died of a stroke. Wycliffe argued for scripture to be Christianity's final authority. In fact, many of his enemies, mostly Catholic clerics who believed he was a heretic, gathered around his deathbed in his last days just in case he wanted to recant something that he'd said earlier in his life. And get this. 30 years after his death, they came and dug up his bones and burned them so they could get the last word. But John Fox says it best in a book about martyrs. Though they digged up his body, burnt his bones, and drowned his ashes, yet the word of God and the truth of his doctrine, with the fruit and success thereof, they could not burn. Because fire is a feeble weapon against God's word. And not only did Wycliffe's translation offer God's word in English to laymen and even women, it also was a precursor to what would happen in the Reformation, which we will cover next time.